Michelle Heaney, Perry Junior High, February 2nd, 2010. Could you please state your name for our records? Frank J. Ferno. Um, uh, I'm going to start with some basic questions. What was your pre-war education? Pre-war education. Uh, high school, uh, Notre Dame High School in Utica, and I went to Fredonia State University for one year, and then I went into the Navy. Um, did you have any pre-war occupations? Uh, nothing really too significant. I mean, I worked for Oneida County for a summer. I worked for the Utica Water Board for a summer. And just before I went into the Navy, I worked for the Bendix Corporation. Um, you enlisted? I did. Okay. Um, what was your reasoning for enlisting? Well, at the time, the Vietnam War was going on. I went to Fredonia, and I never got an A, a B, or an F. I got all C's and D's, which means my GPA was about 1.77, as I recall. <clears throat> there was talk of starting up a lottery, and I was pretty directionless, to be frank, and um, I thought, well, if I'm going to be called up in the lottery as a possibility, then I maybe would be better off if I just joined up, because then I could maybe learn some kind of a skill or something. So I decided to enlist in the Navy. I also figured that if I, didn't, if, that if I went into the Navy, I probably wouldn't have to go to Vietnam which was a consideration at the time. Um, what was your usual, usual daily schedule? Where? Um, when? While you were working in the Navy. Well, uh, well, first you go to boot camp, and that's several weeks. And then after that, it's decided whether or not you're going to get any further training, which I was. And there was two uh, electronic schools that I had to go to, Electronics A and Electronics B. And uh, the first one was right there at Great Lakes, and the second one was down in Dam Neck, Virginia, and that's where I learned how to work on uh, guided missile radars. <clears throat> and so basically, at the first part of my Navy career was going to school and learning how to do the electronics to take care of these radars. And then in, um, I believe it was around September of 1970, I went to Mayport, Florida to be assigned to my ship, uh, which wasn't there, and I had to go on another ship and wait until my ship got there. Then finally my ship came in, I got all settled in, and I went home on leave. Evan and Mojave, if you're in the school, oh, please go to room we'll 142. Evan Mojave, room 142. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That'll be edited. I think it's uh, up to five by the older guy, and now it gets interrupted by this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, while uh, I was uh, on my ship, <clears throat> and we went on a few um, what they call breakdown cruises to get used to being on the boat and all that, and uh, chrono the chronology isn't always exact in my head, but um, got to be close to Christmas in 1970. And that's when we found out that we were going to be the last ship from the East Coast to go to Vietnam. And that raised a lot of problems for me because by then, I wasn't too sure I was in agreement with all that was going on over there. So it becomes a very difficult decision-making process. I went on leave for Christmas time. And I came back and we were due to leave in January. And I talked to my parents about it at home. I said, well, I don't know, do what you want to do. And uh, uh, I went back a couple of days early. I remember it distinctly. I went to a hotel in Jacksonville. Then I stayed there by myself for a couple of days. And I just thought things over and tried to write things out. And then finally, when I went back to the ship, I had a, red, a letter written out telling them that I couldn't see any other way out of this other than to tell them that I was a conscientious objector and that I didn't want to go to the war. And of course, things kind of blew up then, of course, because you're on the ship, you're supposed to be working on radars, and now you're telling us you don't even want to go to the war. So <clears throat> that began a whole series of events of 
being interviewed by psychiatrists and um, senior officers and being um, restricted from doing my my job because my job was had like um, you needed a security clearance to be working on these radars and of course they immediately assume that if you're a conscientious objector you're not going to want to have anything to do with that because it's a weapon of war uh, so they took me off all those jobs uh, but they let me go on the cruise and it ended up being a wonderful experience from the point of view of we left from Florida we went down through the Panama Canal around over to Hawaii we stopped in Pearl Harbor we went from there to the Philippines, and we went from there to Vietnam, <clears throat> and we were in Vietnam for several months. And all this while, my case was quote-unquote pending, and um, we also had stops when we went to have uh, ship repair and refueling and resupplying. We went to Japan for that, so I got to see Japan, and then on the way back, we went down through Singapore, and uh, Hong Kong and we went through down back through the Indian Ocean so we went to the Seychelles Islands um, and all this time I was really working just as a crew mate just a bosun mate you know like chipping paint and uh, keeping places clean and <clears throat> standing watch every once in a while things like that um, so then uh, came back we went down around the Cape of Good Horn, down around the bottom of Africa. We went to Rio. Uh, we came back up around to uh, Guantanamo Bay, and then we went back to Mayport. I mean, it was literally a trip around the world, which was fabulous. You know, you can't beat that. I mean, in retrospect, it was wonderful. Um, and they still hadn't made any decision about what they wanted to do with me. Uh, and then a few months later, um, one of my uh, one of the officers on the ship, a commander, um, told me uh, that they had decided to, to discharge me and to discharge me honorably, which was a thrill to me because um, you know it's, it was very conflicting because you know, I love my country. I think that everybody should serve their country. I thought that at the time, uh, but you know people were. It was a very upsetting time, a very confusing time. I did what I thought I had to do without, I mean, I, I had opportunities. I actually spoke with people who wanted me to go to Canada, um, wanted me to go AWOL, and, you know, I just couldn't do that. I mean, um, it put me in a very bad position in a way because, you know, the people who people who were in the Navy and in favor of the war looked at me like I was, you know, some kind of a traitor or something. And that wasn't it at all. And, you know, I think some of the officers and eventually the one that really kind of took me under his wing kind of un understood where I was coming from. Um, it was very interesting. Uh, but it ended up okay. I, I'm, a, I'm an honorably discharged uh, Navy veteran. I'm very proud of it. Um, and in the end, I'm really proud of what I did because I felt it was the right thing to do. Um, so I never really worked on radars too much, but I was trained to do it. Um, I don't know. What else can I tell you? It was quite an amazing experience. Um, I read that you enjoyed becoming a shellvac. Could you? Shellvac is uh, <clears throat> when you're on ship and your ship is going around the world, and you cross the international date line, you become a shellback. And there's a big ceremony, and it's a lot of hazing. It's a lot like, uh, almost like some kind of fraternity hazing where you have to crawl around the ship and you have to kiss the, the belly of the uh, sea god. You know, somebody sits up there like Neptunus Rex and he's got the trident and you get to do silly things. and. Then you get a big certificate, which I was going to bring today, but I couldn't find it. But I got a certificate for going over the international date line, and you also get a certificate. It's called um, Becoming a Turtle, I believe.
when you become a turtle you go across the equator and then you get a certificate for that. And it gives the exact longitude and latitude that you crossed over and it's kind of exciting. So I've got both of those. Um, what did you do for entertainment? Played a lot of cards. Uh, that was, seemed to be the big uh, uh, diversion. Played, that was where I learned how to play cribbage in the Navy. I learned how to play poker in the Navy. I learned how to play pinochle in the Navy. And that's all we did all the time. And that and going on shore, of course. Shore leave was always great. Um, how did you feel about the way foreign nationals treated Americans? You know, for the most part, my experience was excellent. I, I don't know if it was just me, but I never had a problem. Never felt like uh, they didn't want me to be there. Even uh, any country, I mean, Asia, Africa, South America, I always felt welcome. I always got along really well with everyone. Um, who are the people you're going to remember the most from? Well, I remember Bosun Mate Chief uh, Driggers. He hated me, so I remember him a lot. And uh, the commander that I spoke about who kind of took me under his wing, I remember him a lot. There was guys that, um, when we were in radar school in Dam Neck, Virginia, we were allowed to live off base, and I had three roommates there, <clears throat> two of whom I occasionally keep up with, one I haven't heard from in quite a while. Um, but I remember all those guys. How did the war impact your life? Like, how is it different from the way it would have been? Well, I, 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 don't, I don't know if I ever would have went in the service, to be honest with you. If the war hadn't been going on, um, it just wasn't something that I w ever really thought about when I was growing up. I mean, it was never... Uh, my father w had been in the Army, but it wasn't like we were a military family or anything like that. Um, it just... All of a sudden, it became an option. I knew, I knew one thing, that I didn't want to be on the ground in Vietnam, so I thought, well, this is the way to, do, the way to go. Um, it satisfies my obligation, I can be true to my country and loyal to my country, but I won't have to get killed, was the way I thought. And, um, and from there, I mean, when I got out, <clears throat> I think you grow up a lot, and, uh, you know, taught me how to just take charge of my own life. I got a job, I eventually went back to school. I kind of did the circuitous route of school too. I, and I went in the Navy, I came out and went back to school. I did really well. Then when I got out of school, I knocked around for a little more while and then I went back to law school. So <laughs> eventually I got to be a lawyer and you know, I'm really happy with that. I've been a lawyer for 20 years now. So. What else? Ready for some more questions yeah. from us? Sure. Okay. My question that I have is when you went around the world, basically, and you went to all the different ports, mm -hmm. what did what did the military do in those ports? Like, what was what was the purpose, I guess, of going to all those places? Since we weren't we were active in Vietnam, why did why did you hit all those other places? Well, most times it was to refuel and to get supplies and pick up mail and things like that. Um, <clears throat> when we went to Japan, I think we had some actual um, things that needed to be repaired or updated, uh, so we were there for a couple of weeks. But usually it was, and it was also to get you off the ship. I mean, you get a little stir-crazy on a 427-foot boat with, you know, a few hundred guys that are, a few weeks you want to get off. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was several, I think it was like maybe almost two weeks to get from Mayport over to Hawaii. So then you're ready, you, you know, you go off. You know, that mostly that's sightseeing and drinking, mostly. Okay. You know. Was two that, weeks the longest you were at sea for continuing? No, we were at sea when we were um, doing carrier escort off Vietnam. And what that is basically is where you um, tail around and behind the the aircraft carrier that's going up and down the Gulf of Tonkin. Um, we were out there, that's called being on the line. We were on the line for something like 44 days or something like that. It was a long time. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, we were there right in the middle of summer, so a lot of days were 
100 degrees or more. Or it gets uncomfortable. You're ready to get off ship then. So, did yeah. You have, did you have any other um, shipmates that were conscientious objectors as well? Mm, not that I know of. Okay. No, not on my boat. There was, uh, <clears throat> there was a guy I remember who got off the boat um, because he sequestered himself in a compartment with a gun and said that he was going to kill himself. But, and um, there was maybe one or two other guys that kind of went AWOL, but I think they were just nutty. I don't, think they did. I don't think they did it for any particular reason other than they just didn't come back for a while. No, there was no other concept. Okay. There, there was guys that we that I talked with about it, and uh, and like I say, when I was in um, when I was in Mayport, and we found out that we were going to go there, and I kind of made it known to a couple of friends that I was handed in this letter, and that's when they hooked me up with people that they knew that were counseling guys on going to Canada and uh, you know, real anti-war guys. Was there any, I mean, were there any guys that gave you any animosity about that or treated you differently? Chief Bosun made triggers. Okay, so he was the one, he was he the He was one. the big one, okay. yeah. Yeah, and there was, and there was others. Mm -hmm. But most of them were just, you know, as long as you're doing what you're doing, you know, we're not going to bother you. It was weird. I was kind of ostracized for a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. I was thinking that that would set you apart from other people and they would not necessarily trust you or, you know... There like, was a period of that. Yeah. Yeah, you especially very alone. when they first made the decision and they decided that I couldn't be a fire control technician, which is what the job is called. Um, fire control being people that shoot things off, missiles and or guns. And um, <clears throat> when they decided they really didn't... At first, I don't think they really knew what to do with me, except they knew they didn't want me in the radar room and they didn't want me in the computer room, um, just for security purposes. And um, so then they finally decided, well, you're gonna you're gonna bunk down with the bosun mates. And at first, it was definitely, well, who the heck are you? you know? And the chiefs, of course, knew why I was there. The regular sailors didn't. That didn't, it would only come out like through the grapevine, you know, but only the big boys were actually advised of what my status was. Uh, so for a while it was definitely weird, yeah. Yeah, I was on my own for a few months. So, now I don't, I don't know if I was out there. When did you go in and when did you come out? So like what was the... October of 68 I went in and March of 72 I got out. So you came, you were... Almost four years, At yeah. the end, too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we were the last ship from the East Coast to go over. But yeah. you would, were enlisted for four years. Was that what you had signed on for? Yeah. And you were almost at the end of your four years, but that wouldn't have held true. They would have made you go over your four years if you ended up... Would they have... Would they mean? If you ended up at... Um, oh, well, you still ended up over there, but... I'm just, I was just thinking, like, um, they discharged you just shy of your four years. Right. And, and I'm thinking Well, that at that time, especially since the war was, quote, unquote, on winding down by then, mm -hmm. by, by 72, it was starting to. And <clears throat> they were offering, offering a lot of early outs. Oh, okay. A lot of people who had four-year hitches got out in three and a half, that kind of thing. Oh, all right. So yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't unusual for that time. Right, okay. right. But... Um, it was a big decision for them, too, apparently, because they actually, I think, talked about me not going on the cruise at all. Because, I mean, I handed the letter in a week before we were supposed to go, or 10 days, however much it was. And then I think there was a lot of discussions about, well, should we even let them go? And, you know, what did you want to do? I was, if the decision was that I had to go, I was going to go. Right. I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to um, not obey my country, let's put right. it that way. You know, if they said, you're going to go, I'm, I went. And But then they said, but you're not going to do anything that involves anything with security or shooting the missiles or anything okay. like that. I said, well, okay. Uh, that was punishment enough, I right. guess. Because I had all that training. Right. You know, I, I'm 
sure they weren't too happy about that. Yeah. Would you it was have a cost to train me? Yeah, and would you have preferred that they had let you just avoid the cruise? I mean, at that time, looking back now, it doesn't seem you said it was a nice look. But would you have preferred to have stayed on? You know, stayed at that so time, on? I think I would have preferred yeah. not to go. Not yes. to go at all. Right. Yeah, that would be fair to say. Yeah. Makes sense. In retrospect, I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. <laughs> Well, it was and it actually, experience. you know, it, it, yeah, and it ended up with a, you know, sort of like a happy ending. Um, you know, I've been ambivalent about it my whole life. Mm -hmm. you know, like I, when I, after I became a lawyer, I was, my, one of my first jobs was in Syracuse, and I had met some guys that were in the Italian-American veterans post out there. My father was Italian, and, you know. So I went and I talked to them, and they... And I got pretty good friends with one of the guys who wanted me to drop his will and stuff. And so I go, oh, you got to join the post, you know, we need a sergeant in arms. And, and I have to admit, I felt really funny about it because even though it's an honorable discharge, it says you're discharged because you're a conscientious objector, you know. And I'm like, wow, well, how are these vets going to take that, you know. But, yeah, I screwed up my courage and I brought my DD-214, which is your discharge papers. And so here it is. And then honorable discharge. I said, that's all we care about. So, well, I would think that... Yeah, it was good. And you wanted to serve your country. Absolutely. It's just that you objected the war, and yes. there are two different, very different things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but when you're 19 or 20 years old, it's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, very. To be honest with you. I'm sure. Now, a more technical question. What about the ship itself? Like, what like what kind of ship it was, what its name was, it was what the, it did. Um, it, was a, it was a brand new class of ship at the time. Um, it was called a guided missile frigate. And it, uh, designation was DLG, which means destroyer light cruiser. I don't know how they got that out of the G, but uh, it was a DLG 32. And the name of it was the William H. Stanley, who had been a former admiral in the Navy. It's slightly bigger than a destroyer, but it's smaller than a cruiser. And what they did was, on this particular class, they maintained a five-inch gun. Usually what they had had were two guns, one on each end, a five-inch gun on the back and a five-inch gun on the front. But with this class of ship, they kept the five-inch gun on the back, but they put the new guided missiles on the front. ANSPS 55 Bravo missiles, and it was like a you know missile missile launcher on the front rotating uh, with, with two missiles, and all I got to do afterwards was repaint it after the missile flew off. <laughs> but um, but that was the first class of, of uh, guided missile ships, and then after that they went to missiles front and back. And that was a whole new Spruance class, but. It was, like I said, 427 feet long and a um, crew of about 212, I think, something like that. Um, it was a good ship. So now when you said you painted after the missiles were fired, did you did, were missiles fired in combat or was it missiles just being tested? Tested. Okay. Yeah, never fired in combat. Okay. Um, when we were over there, we went to general quarters twice, I think. What that means is you scramble to be ready in case of an attack. Like you're all sleeping and then the alarm goes off and everybody has to go to their battle stations. Um, <clears throat> that only happened twice. But Vietnam doesn't have much of an air force, so there really wasn't that big of a threat. But we still had to protect the carrier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you were in the Gulf of Tonkin area itself. Right. Which is controversial. Yeah. Just, I mean, the name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With the resolution and. Yes. Yeah. They, yeah. Vastly different wars. That, yes. You know. You know so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, the whole reason for it was different. Mm -hmm. It was the first time that that I thought that we were in a war that I couldn't really figure out why.
why are we why are we fighting this one? Didn't seem like a immediate threat to us. That's where I came down anyway. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I mean I could say my choices were uh, walk away. I didn't want to do that. And it just didn't seem right. So the, the conscientious objector was really the only avenue open to me. I mean I don't know. I to be totally honest, I and then I told the doctors this, you know, I don't know that I'm really a conscientious objector to war in all its forms. I just know I don't want to go to this one. You know, and they said all kinds of I'm immature and all that kind of stuff. You were 19. But it was the only, yeah, <laughs> but it was the only way I could see that I could still do it within the confines of the rules. Right. So that's what I did. And I saw, and I stayed, and apparently they must have thought, well, at least he stayed within the rules, so we're going to make, you know, we'll give him an honorary discharge, honorable discharge. Well, and obviously the military did something for you in terms yeah. of education-wise. Oh, absolutely. Because you obviously changed your... Yes. Your ways and became uh, a lawyer, which is a lot yeah. of schooling. Yeah. So, what else? What else did the military do for you? I mean, because you said that you think everybody should serve their country, which is you know. A yeah, great I think thing it. Do. I think it goes a long way to uh, teaching you some discipline and uh, how to organize yourself and how to get yourself up every day and do what you got to do and. Uh, I even had some leadership courses while I was there, and I just had to just think it makes you mature and realize that uh, the world isn't going to be handed to you. And I think, you know, I'm sort of a fan of Israel on that. They make everybody go for two years, and it just it's a growing up time, and it's a, okay now you're you're out of the nest, and here's a, here's two years of training to what it's going to be like, and there you go. <laughs> You know, I, I, I just think that's a good philosophy. Because I don't, especially, well, I don't want to get too crazy, but especially today, I don't know that there's, all the parents are really doing that kind of a job. I know yours are. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you got to, you know, part of a parent's job is to prepare you to do those things. That's all. What else? Anything else? Told you I'd be done by well, three. Well, that's okay. Oh, you know what? I do have one. Of all the places that you stopped, I mean, I know you were in Japan for a couple of weeks. What? Loved what it. place did you love the best, and why? I think I really liked Thailand the best, overall. The people were the nicest, and it was really ironic in a way because um, that was one of the places I liked the best, and then years later. Like, 20 years later, we were able to have a Thai student, exchange student, it just worked out fabulously. And then my wife and I, I'm not married to that woman anymore, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we went back to Thailand and saw her graduate from college and everything. It was fabulous. Um, so I would say Thailand was one of the best. I really liked Rio. The people down there were fabulous. I liked everywhere we went. Yeah. Japan was incredible. Because we did, we got to go to uh, uh, two cities there. We went to Tokyo and Sasebo, and we went to see all kinds of uh, Buddhist places and Shinto places. And, I mean, you just couldn't beat the experience. I got pictures. I should have brought my pictures. Well, I'm putting an album together. When I get it all together, I finally, after all you. these years, yeah. I, uh, I did. I've got an album. I'm going to put all the pictures in. It'd be great. Well, here's a deadline for you. Okay. We have our luncheon from oh, Mary, Mary, end of May. Oh, that's right. I get invited to that, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Are you done, Mrs. I'm, I'm, I think I'm done. Did you? Was there anything we missed? Um, I was. I was sitting here. I think we're done. I mean, did you shut it off already, honey? No. Oh, okay. Okay.